Hello everyone, Aga here with a fresh update on my daily driver build in the formed T1 case. There's a lot to cover in this video, so get comfortable, as I'll be going over upgrading to the formed T1 version 2.1, maxing out the specs of the build with a move to the AM5 platform, making a CPU loop with pneumatic fittings, designing a new anti-sag bracket for the 4090 Founders Edition, and finally a look at the top hat accessory for the T1, complete with thermal tests. Let's get right into it. I've had the original T1 case for more than two years now, and I've built in it twice. It's no doubt my favorite 10 liter case, and it only made sense that I finally moved up to the most recent version. Now, while the changes aren't too dramatic, they do optimize the case in ways that make it that much better. I can now fit normal sized fans on top of my radiator, and the top strut has 9 possible configurations, compared to just the 2 slot or 3 slot options available on the old version. The side panels on the new unit are aluminium instead of steel, and the mesh pattern seems to be slightly less restrictive as well. I like the quality on these, and I think they look and feel much better than the old ones. Both my cases feature the titanium color, but looking at the anodized parts side by side, I have to say I prefer the tone on the original panel. It's not something you'd really care about without seeing the two cases side by side, but it is very noticeable nonetheless. Unlike the original, however, only the front, top and bottom panels are anodized in the titanium color. All of the other parts are powder coated in black, this no doubt helps keep the cost of the case down, but here too the original feels much more premium. The new front panel is a single piece design, with a simple cutout that pays homage to the original two piece panel. Functionally, it doesn't make a huge difference, but here too I preferred the original, as I found it useful to remove the larger panel during assembly for increased room to maneuver around inside the case. One thing that is a massive improvement on the new front panel is the new power switch location. I love how understated it is and the positioning is much better than before. It takes almost no space at all and that's exactly how it should be. Another downside of the new design is a decrease in overall thickness of the machine parts. I did find that the case feels less rigid while building, but once all the panels are in place, the case feels every bit as sturdy as the original, if not more so due to improvements in fitment. You may have noticed from the title of the video that the unit I have here is version 2.1. This incremental upgrade mainly removes the threads of the pass-through ports at the rear, improves PSU mounting, and adds additional holes for a more secure side radiator bracket installation. I won't be looking into side radiator builds in this video, but perhaps that could be something I look into in a future video. So now that we've covered the case, let's talk about all the parts I'm going to be cramming into it. Starting off, the RDX 4090 from last time returns. Shocker, I know, and I'm still keeping it air-cooled. Partly because I just love the look of it, but also because I see nothing wrong with its cooling performance. The CPU, motherboard and RAM for this updated build are all new. I'm going full out on performance density here with a move to the AM5 platform. The CPU will be the AMD Ryzen 7950X3D for the ultimate balance between gaming and productivity, 64 gigs of DDR5 memory and the ASUS B650E Strix motherboard to tie all of this together. The SF750 power supply from Corsair is back as well, and I'll go over some very interesting thermal tests regarding this a bit later on in the video. Let's take a look at the build process itself and how the case is set up for the build. To start off, we connect the front and back panels with struts. The available space in the GPU compartment is maximized by setting up the case in the 3.25 slot configuration. I'll be reusing my LinkUp Gen 4 riser since I already have it and it's a tiny bit longer, but the included one will work just fine. Now would be also the time to add the 6mm motherboard standoffs. To get the 4090 to fit, we do have to temporarily remove the top strut, otherwise there's little chance of getting it inside the case. The Founders Edition is only a 3 slot card, so standoffs are used on the riser bar to offset the GPU closer to the side panel. This will create a nice gap between the GPU and the motherboard on the other side. One of my favorite things about the old build was this anti-sag bracket I designed for the Founders Edition air cooler. Unfortunately, that part is no longer compatible with the new case. The build wouldn't be the same without one though, so I went ahead and designed an updated version. Just like the original bracket, this one too uses the existing support holes located at the rear end of the cooler, hidden under a magnetic cover. One piece attaches to the GPU, while the other acts as a hook that supports it. I tried to stay true to the design language of the case and made the bracket work with all possible configurations. The one you see here is 3D printed using PETG, and I will have 3D printing and CNC files in the video description below. 
I found the bracket useful during installation as well, as it keeps the GPU in place until the top strut is added back and the GPU is fully secured. The standoff you see here on the GPU lock bar is necessary to maintain that gap created by using standoffs on the riser bar. The 4090 really has to be the first thing going into the build, as adding it later would be pretty much impossible. And once that's fitted, we're pretty much done on this side of the case. I'm using the Mod Ultra Lobo again as my pump and CPU block. The super low profile nature of the Lobo is put to good use here, as we only have 48mm of available height in this configuration of the T1. I find it's best to have everything installed on the motherboard before adding it to the case. In the previous build, I had to use slightly shorter mounting bolts for the Lobo, as the included ones were digging into my riser. That wouldn't be an issue this time around, but I used the shorter screws anyway. It's great that the Lobo is compatible with the AM5 socket, since it utilizes the standard AMD backplate. Let's talk a bit about what kind of water cooling setup I went for here. For the past year or so, pneumatic builds in the Form T1 have started taking off. The first build I've seen using this setup was over on Reddit back in December of last year. The user has since deleted their account, but the post is still up however, and I'll add a link to it in the description. So what's the deal with pneumatic fittings? Well, for starters, they are super small, especially so if you go with 6mm tubing. Secondly, they are tremendously easy to work with. You cut the tubing, you push it in, and that's it. You're done. I had used these kinds of fittings before on a water filtration system, and it's indeed a super easy system to work with. Fittings that are compatible with standard computer water cooling parts do exist, even rotary 90 degree fittings, so it's not like we're doing anything too custom here. Now, 6mm tubing may sound inadequate for a custom loop, considering that the inner diameter is just 4mm, but consider that an IIO such as the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 has an inner tube diameter of 6mm, so we're only going one step down from what's more or less standard. If you wanted to match an AIO setup, you could instead go with 8mm fittings and tubing. I know it seems excessive doing only a CPU custom loop, but all of the benefits and ease of use that I'll be showing here translate perfectly well into a full CPU and GPU loop. I am very curious, however, how this setup will hold up in time. I am wondering if there's any risk of plasticizer leaking over time from the PU tubing. So I checked the fins of the Lobo block before installing it into the build, and I will recheck it in the future. To complete the CPU loop, we'll be needing a radiator. The XSPC TX240 is my go-to again. Using the AIO brackets and two Noctua normal thickness fans means using all the available room in the radiator compartment with not a single millimeter to spare. Do keep in mind that you'll need to get creative with mounting the fans to the radiator, as the regular long radiator screws will interfere with the top panel. I could have put the radiator on top this time around, as this is now possible with the new panels, but I chose to have the fans on top for reasons we'll get to in just a bit later. I also have added a coolant temperature sensor fitting on the radiator. And speaking of temperatures, the previous build in the T1 had the power supply installed in the flipped orientation, basically pulling hot air from the GPU flow-through fan and expelling it upwards towards the radiator. Indeed, the PSU was getting very hot to the touch, and I started having some doubts. Before I took the build apart, I added a temperature probe to what seemed to me like the hottest part of the PSU backside, and took readings under gaming load. I did the same thing for the new build, with the temperature probe in the same location, only this time with the PSU installed in the normal orientation, with the fan facing towards the outside of the case. There isn't really any way to mount the PSU in a flipped orientation now, at least not without using mods, but I think the results will be very interesting nonetheless. Let's go back to the build for now. I ended up taking the motherboard out a couple of times in order to route cables underneath it. That gap created by offsetting the riser really helps hide away some of the uglier cables. Cable management is as always a cruel mistress, and I have to state the usual disclaimer that this build would be way harder if not impossible without the use of super soft custom silicone cables. Once all the cable management is figured out, all that remains is adding the radiator assembly. Pre-fitting tubing runs before adding it in is a good idea as it makes your life a bit easier. The last piece of the puzzle is the quick disconnect assembly, which is used for filling up the loop quickly and effectively. This method, however, does require two pairs of quick disconnects and an external pump and reservoir. You could potentially skip all of this by adding a T-splitter somewhere in the loop and using that as a fill port, but I wanted to make my life as easy as possible. The whole quick disconnect assembly thing is kind of ridiculous in size compared to the tubing, but it is super satisfying to use. One caveat here is that the threads of my fittings are too long and bottom out inside the quick disconnects. To get around this issue, some builders use thicker o-rings or these barrow thread reducers. They are rather difficult to find, and on top of that they are extremely frustrating to get to sit right without pinching the o-ring. 
If you want to avoid unnecessary headaches, I'd suggest just using an extension fitting and calling it a day. As a sanity check, I always do a pressure test for about 30 minutes before I start filling the loop with coolant. The external pump method is pretty fast, but it still takes several hours for most of the air to get pulled out of the loop. All in all, I really love the way that the build turned out. It's not quite as nice without the frosted acrylic tubing I used last time, but the convenience more than makes up for it, and I don't have to worry about RAM clearance like I did last time. So let's move on to see how well the build performs. We'll jump straight into Cyberpunk 2077, running the 2.0 update. We'll first go over how the new build performs and compare it to the old build. It won't exactly be an apples to apples comparison as there's too many differences to account for, but at the very least we'll get a good idea about overall performance. After that we'll take a look at the new top hat accessory prototype that Formed was kind enough to send over. Just like in my previous videos, I'm using fan control to set up all my fan speeds. During daily use, I've set curves that ramp up based on whichever temperature is higher between the GPU core and the coolant temperature. The coolant tends to heat up a lot slower than the GPU, so this keeps the radiator fans from lagging behind too much when things get toasty. Something else I should mention here, there seems to be some kind of fan whistling going on from the blower fan on the 4090. I have to pretty much lock this fan to 30% if I want to get rid of this distracting sound. The issue seems to be that the gap between the fan and the side panel is too small. The fix for this could be to run the 4090 in the true 3.25 slot mode, but that would instead mean a tighter gap between the motherboard and the GPU. For the next tests, however, I've set fixed fan speeds on both the radiator and GPU fans. The 7950X3D is optimized with negative curve optimizer values as seen here, while the 4090 Founders Edition is running a mild undervolt profile. After 30 minutes of mostly sitting around in front of V's apartment building, we get a max reading of 67 degrees on the GPU core and 84 degrees on the CPU. The temperature probe I attached to the backside of the power supply gave us a max reading of 58 degrees. So how does that compare to the build in the original case? Bringing up the old numbers, we see that the new configuration is running cooler by 3.5 degrees. Here's that same test again, but this time I dropped fan speeds on the new build to a quieter level. Everything is running much hotter again, which shows us just how much cooling those two top exhaust fans are responsible for. I expected a more dramatic difference here, especially when it comes to the power supply temperature, given that in the new build the PSU is pulling cold air from outside the case, and there's even a nice gap now between the PSU and the flow-through fan of the 4090. Granted, it's only a test of the outside temperature of the power supply, but nonetheless we're getting pretty high temperatures regardless of the configuration. In fact, when we consider that in the old version of the case there was no gap at all between the two components, I find it hard to believe that the regular orientation in the original case would have performed any better. Let's see if we can improve temps further with the top hat accessory. To make use of the increased space above the radiator, I will be using two Fantex T30 fans. The prototype top hat I have here is 3D printed, and it looks pretty terrible. Not the design itself, which I think is actually pretty neat, especially the front vents, but yeah, the finish on what I have here is rather ugly. I also managed to break one of the tabs that slot into the front panel the very first time I tried this on, and by the time I was done with all my tests, the other tab was gone as well. Anyway, how it looks isn't really important, for now let's just see if something like this would even be worth it. For the test, I've settled on a 70% fan speed setting, with the GPU fans running the same 40% fixed speeds as before. This setup is moving a lot more air, while being subjectively quieter to my ear. Let's take a look at the numbers. Straight away, we notice a dramatic reduction in temperatures across the board. The much higher airflow has a positive impact on all the temperatures I've tracked here, with a pretty massive 4 degree drop on the coolant temperature and 5 degrees on the CPU max. I still had quite a bit of extra clearance left with the new top hat, so I wanted to see if there's anything I could do to drop temperatures even further. I've had these Phobia fan gaskets lying around that I never got to use, so this felt like a pretty good opportunity for some science. The idea with these is that they should increase fan efficiency in a radiator setup by eliminating the dead zone underneath the fan hub. I ran the test again, and nope, they don't do anything, pretty much identical results. If you really wanted to commit to using the top hat and make the most out of the 61mm of clearance, you could instead go for a thicker radiator such as the Alphacool ST30. Pair that with the Fantex T30 fans and you should end up with exactly 1mm to spare. 
So would I actually use the top hat? Well, yes, but only if the material and finish would match the rest of the case. The final product is supposed to be made out of polycarbonate, but I feel it would still be too much of a compromise to use a plastic panel on such a nice looking case. For now, I'll stick to running the build with the original aluminum panel and the two Noctua fans. All in all, the V2.1 case has been a nice upgrade. Maybe not quite as big of a leap over the original as I imagined, but it perfects an already outstanding case, and the multitude of configurations and mods that can be done in it means, at least as far as I'm concerned, that the T1 case remains uncontested in the 10 liter category. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and as always, I'm looking forward to your comments, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that I haven't managed to answer in the video itself. I'm not sure yet where to take the build from here, but I'm open to any ideas and suggestions. Bye for now.